All right. Good morning. I don't know about you. Every morning when I teach is good for me. So first I'd like to spend two more minutes on this slide. Not about physics. Physics is done. It's a great example of how our brain works. So I want to solve a problem. I am devising, designing the strategy. I see the symmetry. T equals one point and T equals three point located at the same time interval or distance we can say from the middle point. And I can see another symmetry the interval from the first point, the first time we found, to t equals 1, and the, the interval from t equals 3 to the second point we're looking for is the same. So that's why uh, <coughs> I'm designing a calculation. t2 should be equal to 3 plus the length of this interval. I'm looking at the length of this interval, and my brain tells me, right point 8, right point 8. Why? Well, because of the simple reason it looks and it sees number 0.8 right nearby this time interval. And I took it without critical thinking about it. And it was wrong. But I was happy. I solved the problem. Yeah. But two students ruined my happiness. <clears throat> I start feeling frustrated. But eventually I figure out what went wrong, fixed it, and... Uh, Happy again. So, <clears throat> of course, naturally, the length of this interval is not 0.8. That was a mistake. The strategy was correct. Single mistake. The number is wrong. This uh, interval is equal to 1 minus 0.8, which is 0.2. And the right result is 3 plus 0.2, 3.2, exactly the same number we had before. Again, no matter what strategy we use, the result has to be the same. That's a check mark. And uh, situations like that happen all the time. We just don't realize them because no one tells us anything. And uh, we used to think that we are the governors of our actions. In reality, our brain makes us to do something. Then it makes us feel good about it, and we're happy, unless someone tells something. And uh, if you ask a person sometimes, why did you do that? The answer often, I don't know, I just feel that way. However, without being able to lay down the reasons for our actions, technically we aren't much different from, you know, highly trained circus animals. And I know there's at least one student in this room who would take it you know, seriously, so I'm happy. And in general, when I look at something like this, it feels like a poetry to me. Well, let's go back to prose, physics. So these are uh, the diagrams, many, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven pages of your diagrams. And uh, at least 50% practically absolutely good. You know, you can see, anybody can see three forces acting on the same object in the same direction. So perfect. Some diagrams like this, for example, describes what is happening. Yeah? But it doesn't make an extra step. It doesn't transfer the fact that there is a pressure to a force, which is not a bad thing. Yeah. The clear understanding is presented here. And of course, there are diagrams with a missing force or extra forces. And uh, <clears throat> if you made a mistake, fine. I made a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes. Mistakes are inevitable and unavoidable. But uh, it's a good 
point to take a reflection on why could it happen so you wouldn't repeat the same mistake again. Plus, rebody diagrams is one of the most important tools in me mechanics and physics in general. For about two weeks in PY 106, we're going to do very similar type of a drawing. So it has to be a solid foundation of our knowledge. OK. Now, question to you. You remember this experiment. I'm not going to do it again. We have a weight attached to a spring scale, and we read the number. That's what the weight is, yeah. force acting from an object on a scale. doesn't matter if we hold it or scale this on a surface like this. And that's what we would call a weight. But if we immerse it in liquid, fluid, in general, the reading changes. The weight remains the same. But it appears to be different. So that's what we call apparent weight. The question is, how would that change in the apparent weight of this book affect the change of this reading? And uh, please enter your answer. If you think no change, you select answer number one. If you think the new reading will be 41 newtons, two, etc., etc. And of course, you have to do it by your hand, using your conversational abilities, talk to your neighbors. And of course, the answer is in free body diagram. In a free body diagram acting on the ball first, and then we can make a transition to the forces acting on the plate of the top plate of the scale. Okay. <coughs> if you want to live a long and healthy life, do what you love, love what you do. You can always ask yourself a question, what can I do now? So you read it. What can I do now? Well, draw a diagram. You draw a diagram. What can I do now? Well, use that diagram to extract some extra information. And uh, you can, after that, you can ask the same question, what can I do now? And eventually, uh, if you answer all those questions, you will get the answer. That answer may not be the right, right answer first. Yeah. You can try to check it using a different strategy or ask somebody else what answer do you have and compare. And if you have the same answers, that gives you more confidence. If you have different answers, you should talk it out and figure out what might have gone wrong, who is correct, who is wrong. So that's a standard uh, thinking approach. And uh, for example, if you know <clears throat> this number, which you read when the ball is in the air, 10 newtons, and then you go to a different situation. This arrow, which represents the force of gravity, should have magnitude of what, what, what number should I write right here? The force of gravity acting on the ball in the water. Then, force of gravity is uh, 
defined by the planet and the mass of this object. We can toss it, toss it, roll it, put it in the water, heat it up. It doesn't affect the force of gravity. Still 10 newtons. But this reading now is 8 newtons. How do we know? We can read. We know what apparent weight is. And, uh, well, we have to balance those forces out because if we had only two forces like these acting on this ball, we would have net force two newtons down, and the ball would be moving uh, down with increasing speed. That would break the scale. But in reality, the ball is at rest in equilibrium, which means there has to be a different force acting on the ball. And now we know the reason for that force is that the water acts from around it, pushes it up. And uh, what can we do now? What can we do now? Yes? We can calculate the magnitude of this force exactly because they must be balanced out, so it's going to be 10 newtons. That's the buoyant force, the force acting from the water on the ball, but there is exactly similar force acting from the ball on water, points down, equals 2 newtons, and that affects the reading by 2 newtons. So if it was 40, now it will be 40 plus 2, 42. So the problem is simple, but the strategy is important. So any questions? All right, so <clears throat> we saw this slide yesterday. We just used it again. Uh, this is how we always can measure the buoyant force. But how could we calculate it? Well, we have to do more experiments. And uh, the classical experiment, more than 2,000 years long, invol involves, actually, I don't really need this for this particular experiment. All I need is this. Now I need to pour water in this beaker with a spout. Many, 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 many years ago, when I didn't talk any English, I said beaker with a spouse. People laughed. I didn't care. It's physics. I could speak Russian. Nothing would really changed. So now what we need to do is take uh, an object, immerse it in this liquid. And see what is happening to the forces. Well, this is practically zero. This is, let's say, 12.7 newtons. That doesn't matter. So when I, I need a little bit more liquid. That's what physics is about, waiting, frustrating. And now, placing it, this cylinder, and see what's happening. We can see that the apparent weight is different from the actual weight. By which amount? Well, about maybe one newton or so. But we also see that this cylinder displaces a specific amount of water. And actually, the amount of water displaced has the same volume. Yeah. But what is important, if we use the scale, we can measure weight of the water displaced and compare this number with this number. And turns out it's always the same number. 
<coughs> sorry, not this, the same number. The difference between the actual weight and apparent weight, which is equal to the buoyant force, is equal to the number we read here. So Archimedes was the first one who realized that the magnitude of the buoyant force acting on an object immersed, immersed in water, or any, well, in water for him, is equal to the weight of the liquid displaced by that object. That's it. Weight, not the mass. Weight. So, but if we know the mass, m times g, is equal to the weight of this liquid. So this is an additional uh, way to measure or calculate the buoyant force acting on an object from any type of fluid. We just need to know, first, how much fluid does it displace, and uh, second, what is the weight of that fluid displaced by that object. Of course, we need to write it mathematically, and, uh, well, of course, mathematical statement is just this. The buoyant force is equal to mass of the fluid displaced by an object times g. On the surface of this planet, g is about 10. If you move to a different planet, it's going to be different g, different buoyant force. So now, uh, these pictures represent all possible situations. And if you know how to draw a free body diagram for each situation, you know everything about the buoyant force. So please take as much time as you need and draw two, three, four, five, six, six free body diagrams. <coughs> so I'll try to demonstrate. First of all, you have to copy the pictures because I'm going to switch to a camera very soon. Each free body diagram describes a very specific situation when something is in the fluid, normally water, but could have been milk, mercury, oil, anything, doesn't really matter. Gas, like air, or hydrogen, or oxygen. <coughs> Only in the vacuum, there is no buoyant force, technically. All right, I am ready to switch. Can I? If you still need, if you're finishing the picture, please wave your hand. Okay, I'll wait. Please finish copying or taking a photograph or taking a mental photograph. Can I switch? If you say no, wave your hand. All right. So again, you should use your multitasking skills. On one hand, you should be drawing free body diagrams. On the other hand, just uh, looking at uh, some situations described by those diagrams. For example, Hmm. 
Dank, Inspektor. We'll try a different approach, not as good as that one, but at least you can see it in a regular orientation. So for the first diagram, how should I hold this ball? Not, that, not like that. Nothing is touching it except the string. So it is partially, partially submerged. And how many forces now? Are acting on it. Well, we had two gravity and tension. As soon as fluid starts touching it, we get the buoyant force acting on it. Now uh, I can submerge it completely under the surface. What's the difference now? It displaces more fluid, which means now stronger buoyant force should act on it. I can release it. It sinks to the floor. It sits on the floor. But now, the string doesn't touch it. So now, instead of tension, there is a normal force from the bottom of this bucket acting, plus gravity, plus buoyant force. Now, what if uh, something is floating? How many forces acting now? Do I touch it? No. So no string attached. No normal force, which means only two forces acting on it, gravity and buoyant force. Well, something like this. Heavy weight attached to a light object. And of course, now we're going to put it. Yes? This? This? Does water touch it? That's the answer. There is buoyant force. So what do you expect will happen with this guy? Let's add some more liquid. Why is it red? Why is it red? The water die here. Yeah, put uh, okay. No, too shallow. All right. Now you go down. Oh no! I don't want to die. You will. Just uh, quotes from some mafia movies, uh, nothing related to physics. <clears throat> How many forces acting now? Well, it's a string which pulls down on it. So there is tension plus buoyant force plus gravity, still three forces. And uh, there is one more diagram which I can't model because it has a rod below, so it's something like this, something like this, but stiff, so it's not falling. And there is a difference between a situation when a string is attached and holds it and a rod is attached and holds it. What the difference? Well, to talk about that, first I have to switch back. It survived. This didn't.
So, Case number one, <coughs> tension, because we see it touches the ball, gravity, because it's on this planet, and the buoyant force, because well, fluid touches uh, this ball. Number two, now it sits on the floor. So, same forces, almost yeah, same forces. This now is buoyant force, and this now is the normal force from the floor, and there's the force of gravity acting down. Three forces. <coughs> now, actually, I'm going to do first number four. Why? Because technically there is no difference between two and four. It is a support. The rod is just a support like the floor. So without this rod, if we would remove it, it would sink. That's why it's rod, a solid object. So it supports this ball, prevents from falling down, which means it exerts normal force, plus there is a buoyant force, plus, of course, there is force of gravity. Now, if we go to case number three, it's a string. The string holds it, prevents it from uh, rising to the surface of the water. And if the string holds it, it actually exerts elastic force. It is acting practically like a spring, which holds it. So it pulls down. Oops. And then force of gravity pulls down. So that's tension or elastic. This is force of gravity. But the buoyant force always points up. Now, case number five, floating. The object is floating. So nothing touches the object except, except the fluid, which means there's only two forces, there are only two forces acting on it, buoyant and gravity. And finally, the case number six, A and six, B. <coughs> six, A, presented in the picture. You have a floating object. So you definitely have gravity and buoyant acting on it. But now you also apply an additional force from your hand, for example, applied force. So you have three forces. And the case number three, uh, case number 6B is an equivalent of the case number five. What do you do? You start from the same floating object. You still have two forces, gravity and buoyant. But instead of pushing from above, you start in adding some extra material, extra mass. You place something extra. We can treat that extra material as the source of, of a applied force, or we can just <coughs> treat this situation as case five with increased mass. So this is going to be an additional, let's call it mg force acting down. And these diagrams exhaust all possible situations. For any situation, now, all you have to do is just follow the strategy, draw the picture, convert it into diagram, write the force balance equation because 
object, an object is in equilibrium, so net force has to be equal to zero. Then there might be some additional expressions like F equals mg for gravity, or for the buoyant force, it equals the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. And you're done. All right, examples. So we have a ball completely in some fluid. We don't know what kind of a fluid it is. We don't care at this point. All we know is forces. So for example, the force of gravity acting on it will be equal to 3 times about 10, about 30 newtons. But if we attach it to a spring scale and we read the number, that's going to be 20 newtons. Why is the difference? Because of the buoyant force acting on this ball. And what will be the magnitude of it? It would be the difference between mg and uh, tension, which is 10 newtons. So how much fluid does it displace? Well, we know that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. And weight of the fluid should be equal to the mass of this fluid times g. So 10 newtons should be equal to m of the fluid times g. Hence, that should be about, well, if we treat g as 10, 1 kilogram of fluid. How much is displaced in... Uh, meters cubed by volume. Well, we know the volume of the fluid displaced by the object should be equal to the volume of the object in that fluid. And that's a sphere. So how do we calculate the volume of a sphere? We have to go to Google, ask Google, Google. How do we calculate the volume of the sphere? Google says 4 thirds pi r cubed. So 4 over 3 times pi times. OK, I've been tricked already. That's a diameter. So we have to use a half of that. The radius is 5 centimeters or 0 0.05 of a meter. And we have to cube it. Done. And we don't know it yet technically, but if we know mass and volume, we can calculate density. And if we know density, we can look it up. What kind of a fluid is that? All right. I've got the slide with these calculations. And uh, question. It's not a physics question. Not related to physics. It's a short memory test question. A floating object, how many forces are acting on it? I don't have a floating ball. Well, actually, I do. Very small one. That's it. How many forces right now are acting on this floating ball? And uh, of course, you choose the right answer. I know everybody did the right answer. And uh, now, um, well, just repeat some. <coughs> uh, same strategy. We have uh, a force of gravity acting on it. We have uh, the buoyant force acting on it. And done. No more forces. Which means now the buoyant force is equal to mg. And uh, if the mass of this bowl is a half of a kilogram. That means the buoyant force is equal to 5 newtons, and that has to be equal to the weight of the water displaced, well, in general, any fluid, 
So hence the mass will be equal to 5 over 10. That's it. it's exactly the same reasoning. So it doesn't matter how did we find the buoyant force. Yeah. Could have been several for three forces or only two forces. Still, as long as we know buoyant force, we can figure out how much fluid was displaced by that object. <clears throat> so, we saw this slide already uh, th uh, two times. So question is, <clears throat> can we rewrite the equation which we ex uh, extracted from experiments? Can we rewrite it using some other variables, parameters of a fluid? And the answer is yes. We would have to do more experiments we would have to repeat the same experiment again and again and again using different fluids. First time with water, second time with milk, uh, oil, and see how does it affect the buoyant force. And turns out it does affect. The ball is the same, which means the amount of fluid displaced is the same, but the force is different, which means the amount of fluid in that volume is different. So what do we do? Well, we have to describe how much of matter we can fit in a specific volume. And to describe that, we have to invent a new physical quantity. The, well, technically, it's an average value. Density might change from place to place. But <clears throat> this is a definition of the average density of a matter, material. We have to weight, calculate the weight. We have to weigh, calculate the weight, or measure the weight of a certain object. And then we have to divide the mass of that object by the volume of that object. So density basically equals the mass of a one cubic meter of something. But uh, normally we use this equation backwards because density has been measured for all important materials. So we can use this relationship to relate density, volume, and mass. Now, question, because water is the most important fluid for us, we need to know some specifics about it. The density of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And I believe we actually did exact calculation like five weeks ago. But still, what will be the density of water in grams per cubic centimeter? So how large is a cubic meter this large? One meter by one meter by one meter. If I pour a cube like that with water, put it on a scale, the reading says 1,000 kilograms. That's what density is. Question, if I take one cubic centimeter, which is one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter, pour some water, put it on a scale, <coughs> what will I read? And uh, <coughs> you just have to solve this problem. <coughs> It's a conversion problem. And choose your answer and enter your answer in a web sign. I'm just going to start because this is what we want to do. 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter is equal to a certain number of grams per cubic centimeter. So if we have a cube, one meter by one meter by one meter, the mass of this cube with water in it, the mass of this cube will be equal to 1,000 kilograms. <clears throat> so 
we can do this type of conversion. And if you, uh, well, first of all, everybody has a device connected to the internet because you have to according to the syllabus. So you can use that just to find any conversion factor you may need. I'm going to check what is happening on the website. Does it even work? Are there any people today in this room? I don't trust my eyes. I only trust WebAssign. <coughs> That's a question number four. Okay, pretty good. So, <clears throat> of course, probably the most straight forward way is just calculate it using conversions between kilograms and grams. One kilogram is equal to how many grams? 1,000, yes. Now, the tricky part is converting cubic meters into cubic centimeters. So what do we do? One cube, uh, one for, well, first of all, one meter is equal to 100 centimeters. We know that. So we write. 100 centimeters because that what one meter is and we don't forget we need to write a cube and then that's what we do one zero 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 gram per cubic centimeter I need coffee. You have a question or you have a statement? And why did I do that? And why did I make that mistake? Which is actually very, very common. I've seen this hundreds of times. There is a specific element which is missing. Specific mathematical element. What is the name of that mathematical element? Hmm? Anybody? Can't hear you. A specific mathematical symbol, parentheses, we don't have to use them here, but we could. But if they tell us that we have to cube everything inside those parentheses. So I have to fix it. I fixed it. That's the right answer. And even if this end, uh, end answer doesn't belong to international system of units, actually for many problems it is much more practical to use this unit than kilograms per cubic meter. It doesn't matter, it's up to you. Uh, but uh, basically if you know how many grams of water you have, that's it. That uh, number gives you volume in cubic centimeters or if you know how many cubic centimeters you have, that number gives you mass of the water in grams. All right, moving on. <clears throat> For example, what is the mass of a two liter bottle of soda? Well, we know one liter is equal to 1,000 cubic centimeters. Again, lecture number one. So two liters will be equal to two thousand cubic centimeters which means the mass of two liters will be equal to 
2,000 cubic centimeters times one gram per cubic centimeter, which is 2,000 grams or two kilograms. You could have used kilograms per cubic meter, but you would have to deal with liters and cubic centimeters again. And uh, that would take maybe just a little bit more time. All right, so we can use now an additional expression for the same force, for the buoyant force. <coughs> it is equal to the product of three variables. Well, G is fixed constant. V represents the volume displaced by the object. And now the new variable density of that fluid which is being displaced by that object. This is the standard expression for the buoyant force. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes it is easier <coughs> to think about it differently. The expression is the same, but since we know that the volume of fluid displaced by an object has to be equal to the volume of the object submerged, immersed in the fluid, this expression sometimes just more practical. We can look at how much of this object is below the surface. If it's completely above the surface, no fluid is displayed, zero. If we start moving in the fluid, only that portion which is below the surface experiences the buoyant force. So the more of the object is below the surface, the stronger buoyant force, the maximum is reached. And if we move it up and down, the buoyant force remains constant now. <clears throat> so, uh, okay, I'm going to give you one minute to think about it. We have a ball, same ball actually, which has a mass of three kilograms. And when it is in water, the apparent weight, which is the reading of that spring scale, is 20. Now we make a very dangerous replacement. We replace water with uh, mercury. Why is it dangerous? Well, it's not healthy to breathe with mercury vapor. So we have a mask. And we read the reading of the scale again. What do you expect to happen to that number? If nothing, your answer is number one. If you think your reading will be greater than 22, less than 23, if there's not enough information for, for anything else, any other number, any other number. And of course, uh, it's all in the diagram. Actually, we just need one. Yeah. Because the equation doesn't depend on what fluid is being used. That's the force of tension, which changes in some way. That's the force of gravity, which remains the same because it is acting from the same planet on the same ball. And this is the buoyant force, which depends on the fluid, on a specific property of that fluid, on the density. The volume is the same, G is the same. So the only variable matters is this density. If you look at this chart, if we replace water with mercury, density goes up from 1,000 to 13,600. How does it affect gravity? It doesn't. How does it affect the buoyant force? The buoyant force increases. 
So should you choose two? No. But the question is not about the buoyant force. The question is about the reading of the tension. And the force of tension is equal to mg minus buoyant force. So if you're increasing the buoyant force, you're decreasing tension. <coughs> That's it. So don't answer this question. There are too many questions. And uh, we know basically what should happen because we saw it. We saw it when we have a steel object placed in water. It sinks. And we know steel has density greater than density of water. When we have very, very empty ball, well, if I try to push it and then release, it rises because the density of this ball is less than the density of the water. Actually, oops. Stay. It's a better, just larger representation of this situation. Right now, the string holds it. So there's a third force. And you know what the third force is for, right? <coughs> so why the string is needed? Well, because otherwise it would rise to the ceiling and fly because uh, inside it has hydrogen. And density of hydrogen is less than density of air. And even the additional weight due to just the rubber is not enough. But if the string doesn't hold it, that's it. It rises. So as long as the average density of an object less than the density of fluid, if we let it move, it rises. So <clears throat> basically all we have to do is just to compare two forces, because we don't hold it with a string or with a hand. There's fluid, there's an object, and there's force of gravity, and <coughs> there is buoyant force. And we have to compare buoyant force versus force of gravity. How do we do that? Well, now we can replace the mass with the product of density and volume. So for the buoyant force, it should be density of the fluid times the volume of the object, because it's completely inside the fluid, times g, versus what? Well, this little m represents the mass of the object, which means it should be equal to the density of the object or material of the object, times the same volume, times the same g. So the relationship between the forces solely depends on the relationship between the densities, because volume canceled, g is canceled. That's it. So now how we can predict what will happen if we release an object in a fluid. Depending on the densities, it might sink, it might fly, or if the density, the average density of the object is equal to the density of the fluid, it will remain at rest. That's how you boat maintains its location. Of course, it's made of steel. And of course, density of steel is larger than density of water. But the average density of the U-boat submarine might be managed by sucking water in or pushing it out. So <clears throat> an example of a calculation. All right.
for a floating object. I've got this cylinder. Nothing to do with this company. I wish they would pay me for the advertisement. It floats. So what can I do? I can measure uh, the diameter. So please, I'm going to read the numbers. Please write them down. So the diameter of this cylinder is... Well, about seven centimeters, okay. Now, I can measure approximately how much of this cylinder is above the surface of the water, which is about five centimeters. And of course, I can measure total length, 17 centimeters. And now, question is, what is the mass of this cylinder? And if we know the mass and the volume, we can calculate the density. And that is how Archimedes figure out the density of the crown. Well, you probably know the story. If you don't know the story, Google Archimedes. So, oops. Ah, yes. It's just an illustration that we don't solve a new problem. It's practically exactly the same problem we've done before, just more data. So, just a bigger picture, because as you know, a small picture is not really a picture. Good picture must be big picture. Plus, drawing helps to fire up additional neurons. So we always have to draw our own picture. <clears throat> so the diameter was equal to what number? Seven centimeters, yes. Thank you. I remember that was uh, what's called L. Five centimeters, yeah. The total length was, uh, let's call it big L, 17 centimeters. That's it. We also know it's water. And what does this word tell us? Density. The name of the fluid tells us, look the density up. And density of water is either 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter or 1 gram per cubic centimeter. So <clears throat> how many forces are acting on this cylinder? Please, if you think one, show me one finger. If you think two, show me two fingers. If you think three forces, show me three fingers. If you think four forces, show me four fingers. To take physics, you need fingers. Two, two, two. Yes, it's like a fifth time we talk about floating object. So two forces, and uh, we need to know the name for each force, force of gravity and the buoyant force. And then we need to make a transition from the name to the actual expression for the gravity is mg for the buoyant force. It should be equal to <coughs> the density of the fluid, in this situation, water, times. And now you choose. Different people choose it differently. They write the volume of water displaced by an object or the volume of the object <coughs> in water in water below the surface times g and because the object is in equilibrium magnitude of the gravity force of gravity should be equal to the magnitude of the buoyant force So <clears throat> the mass of the cylinder should be equal to G cancels, density of water times the volume, but not the total one, only of the, of, of the object in water. 
So now we can start using numbers. And I want to use the density of water in grams because it's a simple number, one gram per cubic centimeter, which means now I have to calculate the volume of which part of that part which is in water, which is, where is my marker, below the surface, this part. That is a cylinder, smaller cylinder than the actual cylinder. So how do I calculate the volume of a cylinder? Area times height equals one times area, that's a circle, pi, r squared, and the height will be equal to the difference between the total length and that length, length measured above the surface. So numbers, pi times, uh, I use centimeters on purpose, so Diameter is seven, so seven over two, that's radius, and we have two squared, times sev 17 minus five, why do I work? See, that's what the brain does. Tricks us all the time. Five, and then laughs at us. So, pi, well, I'm done. Please finish the calculation. Tell me the number. Well, we can round it up. 461, what unit should I write? That's the most important question. What unit did I use for density? I used grams per cubic centimeters. And I multiplied by cubic centimeters. So what's left? Grams, exactly. That's why it's very convenient. Or, well, about. I know the answer, about a half of a kilogram. My uh, measurements, of course, weren't very accurate, but if I take this cylinder, place it on a scale, and I know why it's a half of a kilogram, because I put a half of a kilogram inside it. That's how physics works in this particular situation. We didn't invent any new strategy. We used the same strategy with a couple of, well, technically now, with only one additional equation for the expression uh, for the magnitude of the buoyant force. That's it. Uh, OK, so. We want to sink the floating object completely in water. OK. So the initial situation is the floating object a part of it is below the surface, a part of it is above the surface, but we don't care yeah, about this because what we need to do is we need to find what additional force or additional mass should be added to make it completely in water. So right now, when it is completely in water, we will have three forces acting on gravity, buoyant, and that applied force. And of course, uh, <clears throat> the applied force plus the force of gravity, because they both point down, should have the same magnitude as a single vertical force, which buoyant force. 
So they apply the force we are looking for will be equal to the difference between the buoyant force and gravity. And the buoyant force will, is equal to the density of water times the volume. Now, which picture should I use for this calculation? The picture number one or the picture number two? Number two, picture one has no applied force. And the second picture shows the ball completely below the surface. So this is just the total volume of the ball times G minus mg. Okay, we have to start plugging numbers. And, uh, well, okay, let's use kilograms for illustration. So 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter times the volume. That's a sphere, 4 thirds pi radius cubed. And the radius equals a half of a diameter, so 0.11 cubed. Times G, which is 10, minus Mg, a half of a kilogram, times 10. That's it. You can finish the calculation. That will be Newton's. But now... It's easy to find what additional mass should be added because that additional mass, mass additional, should have weight. That hence, which should be equal to the applied force we just have found. <coughs> so the applied force should be equal to additional mass times G. So that additional mass would be equal to applied force over 10. <clears throat> but of course, there was additional way to calculate it. There's another way. So someone should calculate the force and tell me eventually, but for now. What would be another way? Another way would be redrawing the picture differently. This is what we had. And again, this picture doesn't really matter. We don't use it. We use it just as a mental transition to the situation we have to analyze. And what we have now is the same object completely in water Plus, I don't know, some additional mass, well, maybe a ring attached to it because it's a ball, or something else put on the top of it. So what do we draw now as a diagram? There is a force of gravity acting on the whole system, and the whole system is equal to the mass of the ball plus the additional mass. And the buoyant force should be acting on the whole system. And normally, unless something said specifically about the size of that additional mass, we neglect the size of that additional mass. It's small. So the buoyant force is acting only on the ball. It's large. So the buoyant force still will be equal to <coughs> the density of water times the volume of the ball times G. And you set them equal. And you calculate the additional mass. And you get exactly the same number, which is, please tell me. What should I write here? Hmm? Do we have it? Maybe, I honestly don't know. So you say 45.7. If anybody has a different number, please tell me. Now or never. 
Okay. For me, this is a question mark. I don't want to spend my time now for checking it. I will do it later after the lecture, just in case, to make sure everything is right. Okay. This is the question number six. And I want to ask it because uh, I need some time to prepare this demonstration. This is what is happening. We have a lake. We have a boat with an anchor. And the boat floats. And this is the level of the lake right now. What I'm going to do, I'm going to take the anchor. Well, the anchor goes on the floor of the lake. So I'm going to take it out from the boat, put it in water. And uh, something may happen or may not happen with the, the level, right? So by now you should enter your answer. So all I have to do is just take out the anchors. So, so far I just put them on the shore. And now I'm putting them in water. So right now, the level dropped. Why? Because this boat now is not heavy as it was before. So it doesn't need strong buoyant force anymore to float. So only a small portion of water should be displaced. So now, the critical yeah, situation. What's happening? Not much. Still much lower than before. Why? Well, because those weights don't displace much of water. Yeah, they're small. They have some volume. They do displace some water, but not as much as uh, the heavy boat. <clears throat> That's it. So this is uh, just, uh, an, again, an illustration of a type of reasoning we may need to use sometimes to describe what is happening when we change the system by adding or taking out some elements of that system. Don't answer this question. So let's just uh, think about it. What will happen if this element will be removed? Element. We don't know what it is. We saw in previous experiments, the result depends on the type of the element. So what types could be used? A solid rod or a spring or a string? If it's a solid rod, it acts like a normal force and prevents it from sinking. If it's a string or a spring, it, <coughs> it prevents it from rising. So there is not enough information. We cannot answer based solely on this picture. But if we know it's a spring or a string, in that case, we can draw. That's not me. No? OK, good. <clears throat> we could just have to draw a free body diagram. And free body diagram now, again, one of those six diagrams we've used before, we just have to know which is which. Here, if it's a spring or a string, tension holds the ball, prevents it from rising up. The buoyant force always points up, and there is a force of gravity acting on it. And if we write, the force balance equation, mg plus force of tension, should have the same magnitude as force, buoyant force. And uh, if this is what we're looking for, force of tension, that should be equal to the difference between the buoyant force and the mg. <coughs> so how do we calculate um, the buoyant force? 
density of water times total volume of the ball because it's completely submerged times G minus. How do we calculate the mass of the ball? Density of the ball times the total volume of the ball times G. So basically our calculation is this difference between density number one and density number two times total volume times G. In numbers, if we use grams, one gram minus 0.8 grams per cubic centimeter is times four thirds pi times a half of a 10 centimeters cubed times 10. We have calculated tension. However, if we told specifically this is a spring <coughs> with the given spring constant, now we can apply the Hooke's law. And I'm sorry, but I didn't tell you the name yet of that law. I told you the law, I didn't tell the name. It's a Hooke's law. The magnitude of the elastic force is proportional to the spring constant and the elongation or contraction of the spring. So if we know the elastic force, which is this force of tension, it also has to be equal to the product of spring constant times the elongation of this spring. So the elongation of this spring will be equal to the magnitude of this force divided by the spring constant, wherever it is. We need this number in Newtons. Ah, actually. Will we get Newtons? No, we will have to make a conversion. That's a tricky part. I used grams. So my unit for the force will not be kilograms times a meter over a second squared. My unit will be a gram times a meter divided by a second squared. That will be my unit. You may ask, how do I get a meter if we use centimeters? Well, centimeters cubed canceled because of the density and the volume, but this meter comes from G. Or you could have used density in kilograms per cubic meter immediately, and that would give you newtons immediately. And actually, that's also a good exercise. If we know that one gram per cubic centimeter is equal to 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, this density, the density of the material the ball is made of, 0.8, grams per cubic centimeters will be equal to, we just have to multiply by a thousand, 0.8 times thousand kilograms per cubic meter, which is 800 kilograms per cubic meter. So the density of the material of the ball is less than the density of water, that's why it would uh, rise, that's why we need a string to hold it. Questions? Suggestions? So the strategy again is a standard strategy for solving any problems related to forces acting on an object with an additional relationship about the buoyant force and sometimes with an additional relationship for mass and density and volume. Nothing else. And we are done with the buoyant force. So now, moving on to the next topic. <clears throat> I just started today. We could actually make this experiment. Two beakers with the same amount of water. Placed on a scale. Of course, the scale reads the same number, same amount of water, same mass. But is there any difference how that mass is being distributed 
over the area? Well, there's a simple experiment which tells us that, yes, there is a difference. So this is just salt, nothing toxic. And I have two objects which have practically the same mass. Not liquid, but solid. A 500 gram weight and a 500 gram rod. 500. But they have different area. So when I place them on the surface, the mass distribution is different. How does it affect uh, the action from this weight on this salt. Well, let's see. I release it. Nothing. Now I take the same rod, place it, and release it. And it sinks by more than one centimeter. So it's not just the mass which matters for us. It's also how it's being distributed. And of course, in physics, if something is important, has to be named, has to be defined. This is another example of why mass distribution matters. The same person, different mass distribution. Only one single nail, yeah, a sword, or many, many, many single nails makes difference. And of course, this is how snowshoes work. You distribute your mass over a larger area, so you don't sink in the snow. So an official definition, an official name of this new physical variable is pressure. Mass distribution is that what pressure is. Emotional distribution also is pressure. So <clears throat> an official definition of pressure is a force acting on one square meter of surface. We should call it average pressure if it changes, but it's not important. And uh, the unit of pressure, of course, <laughs> comes from the definition, a newton over a meter squared. That unit has a name, pascals. This is an official unit of pressure in international system of units. Don't answer this question. We've done too many questions. Let's just uh, solve it because it's a very straightforward calculation now. We have a rectangular, not circular, rectangular because it's easier to calculate the area for rectangular uh, shape. We have a rectangular base. The whole cylinder is 10 meters tall. So base is 0.2 meters by 0.2 meters, okay, if you, we use meters. And it is filled up with water. And what do we know about water? Density of water is equal to 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So we need to know the mass first and then the pressure it exerts. How do we calculate the mass? It's equal to density times volume, so it will be equal to 1,000 times 0.2 times 0.2 gives the area, times 10 meters gives, times 10, 10, 10 meters gives the total volume. So what do we have? It's going to be 100 times 2 times 2, 400 uh, kilograms. Water is heavy. And of course, uh, we do that calculation to calculate the pressure. So what do we do to do that? We have to use the definition of pressure. The pressure it exerts on the surface should be equal to force over area. That force should act on the surface. That's what we call a parent weight. And of course, parent weight. According to Newton's third law, it had the same magnitude 
as the normal force acting on this cylinder, which is equal to the force of gravity acting on this water, so it should be equal to 400 kilograms times g, divided by the area, 0.2 times 0.2. That's the pressure in pascals. But the most important takeaway from this This, we don't have to use numbers. So we have a tall object. The volume of this object equals area times height. The mass of this object equals density times volume, which is density times area times height. The weight of this object is equal to mass times g, which is density times area times height times g. And now the pressure it exerts will be equal to this weight over area. So density times area times height times g over area. What is happening to the area? Getting canceled. So this is the expression which tells us how we can calculate the density, uh, the pressure exerted on a surface by any, well, tall column of material, any type of material, any type, solid, liquid, gases, gases. So this is a standard expression. We, okay, we did that. 400 kilograms times 10, or 4,000 newtons. So this is a standard expression for calculating a pressure exerted on the surface by a column of material. This expression has a name, the gauge pressure. It's important to know the difference between the gauge pressure, pressure and the actual pressure. For example, this water column exerts pressure. And if I calculate density times uh, high times gravity, that will be the pressure from this water only. But what is else above water? We breathe. Atmosphere. So the atmosphere is very tall. It also exerts a pressure. How do we call that pressure? Atmospheric pressure. So the actual pressure, if we insert a device to measure that pressure, will be equal to the gauge pressure, the pure pressure from this water, plus the atmospheric pressure from above. All right, done for today. Thank you very much. You see what I'm going to do tomorrow. So tomorrow, if you want to see the demonstrations, I'm going to be selling tickets. I'm sorry.